Okay. Oh, wow. It's going. Uh, to some extent, I'm winging this. Uh, because I haven't been like living in the world of attention, I've um, I, I'm mo I'm mostly I've been uh, when I read about this, I saw the connection. I saw this was months ago. I saw how like here's how I would present this at Numenta. Here's how I would uh, sort of free this from the language of mathematics and neural networks that is written and and try to discuss it in the sense of what it says, of what it might say about the cortex uh, and. And like, is the word attention, does it even make sense to use that word for all of this? I'm not going to give you a conclusive answer to that. I'm going to talk around it and tell you how it could or it couldn't, depending on how you, you interpret it. Uh, so here I'm going to focus on two papers in particular. Uh, one is to kind of give some history on where the word attention came into this. I'll just quote this a little bit. Um, where the word attention came into this, I'm going to talk about this paper, Recurrent Models of Visual Attention, uh, from, it's from a group of deep mind people, including Alex Graves. What year was that? Uh, this is 2014. Okay. Uh, and, and, then, and I'm only going to talk about it in like, cartoon detail, but it, it's enough to, uh, you'll, you'll understand it, because it has a lot of connection to what we've done. Uh, and then I'm going to move on to uh, this other one, Attention is All You Need which is this more crazy looking picture over here. Uh, and so the flow of this is going to be like, talk a little bit about, about the first paper. Uh, I'm going to imagine an alternate model, imagine another alternate model, and then say, and I'm basically showing a smooth transition from one to the other, where the word attention, how it's, the meaning of attention has sort of evolved. And what is the year of that paper? This is 2017, yeah. So it's a couple years after that one. Yeah. Yeah, this was 2017, and um, and this underlies a lot of the most recent things generating buzz. For example, um, OpenAI has the GPT-2 language framework, where you, uh, la language model, where you see them like auto-completing entire stories and writing essays that are almost coherent. Uh, and it's like it's a bunch of really impressive stuff has come out of this. So I guess like something that's cool about all this is the models are cool and they work. <laughs> they're, they're clever and they work, which is nice. Uh, and so... And these have been sort of blowing past all the language benchmarks uh, yeah. pretty much over the last few years. Yeah. And so I'm going to talk a little bit in, in terms of language, but also in terms of vision. Because like, here I'm going to start with this recurrent models of visual attention. But then I'm going to jump to these things where they applied it to mostly NLP. And, and, but you'll be able to see how it also can be applied to vision. Uh, so, starting with like, recurrent models of visual attention. Um, okay, to, one way I could summarize this is I wish I had cited it in Columns Plus. Uh, it's, and when I say Columns Plus, I'm referring to our paper, Locations in the Neocortex, are one where we have the in-depth model with grid cells and building maps, sensory maps of objects, with moving sensors and everything. So. I didn't know about this paper when we wrote that because what we call sensory motor inference, they they call uh, attention. Uh, what, 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 what they were, what we refer to as moving, and we think of saccading eyes. Uh, they talk about this. This is quite similar to a saccading eye, except that it is doing something we talk about. So that's like time. that's like uh, overt attention is the term we would have term refer to. Overt is attention when you yeah. look, like you're visually but moving some sensor to it to. That focus on a particular part of the world. So it requires yeah. movement as opposed to the. Yeah, and I think that would be probably closer to covert attention. Oh, well, it's actually. I, well, 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 psychotic eye movement would be covert. They, they don't make it clear whether something's moving here. Oh, they I have think, an I input image. That. They have an input image, and they're choosing which part of the image to pass into the model, which is essentially psychotic. The thing is, one thing they do do where it's a little bit different from psychotic is, I mean, if it were truly psychotic, these boxes would all be the same size, but they're kind of zooming in and zooming out. They're 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 saying like first view might get a broad view uh, of the image. Uh, Second is like zoom in on this certain part. Third, yeah. look look at this. I part think part. if you if you are, if you're changing the sort of size, that would be the overt attention, and if you I mean the covert attention, yeah. and if you're changing the location, that would be the overt attention. Did I say that wrong? Well, covert before? could also change change the location. Uh, yeah, but not as easily. I mean, we can attend to some little extra off the side, but generally, generally, yes, covert. Well, and I always, I've always thought of covert attention as a type of sensory motor movement, just like over yeah, attention. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Although so it might be a separate, somewhat separate mechanisms, but I don't know. Anyway, 
So I think it's important to, to keep those in mind. I mean, if you're trying to relate just the brain theory, that's, those issues are important. Okay. So, so this has a fair amount of overlap with what we've done. It's not the same thing. They're not. We were explicitly building like 3D maps of objects, uh, where they're they're training something to move a sensor over an object to classify it. But it, they're not necessarily building a true spatial map of any kind. They're not. They're they're just letting it learn whatever it learns. So it's not the same model as ours, but it was solving a very similar problem. Uh, so the, this is where. Um, the, Okay, the word, the word use, using the word attention here makes a lot of sense. It's not that crazy to call this attention. Uh, so I'm going to evolve toward this thing that where it starts to seem a little strange over here. You can see kind of smooth transition. Uh, so now let's imagine just taking this and have multiple of them in parallel, multiple moving sensors. Uh, just have an array. Let's even call these cortical columns if you want. Uh, it, but when you say this, what is this? Uh, what is G here? And what, what exactly? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I wondered if that would <laughs> look like a G. That is a recursive uh, arrow. Well, I thought it was a G too. That was interesting. <laughs> oh, I, like I actually tried drawing it different ways. Uh, so what is that box? This, this, it's a circle is, or arrow. this is a layer of cells that that has recurrent connectivity. Okay. That arrow is a that is a that is a arrow pointing back to side of G. <laughs> And what are the two, like, what is the network there that you're referring to? The, so he, this is an input image. Uh, sensor is being moved over the image. The input, this, this is a recurrent network that is receiving sensory input. Uh, it is then using it to figure out how to move the sensor or how to change the attention. Uh, and then it is receiving subsequent input and repeating. Now, I'm just going to take that exact thing and put a m multiple of them next to each other. Uh, if you have multiple independent moving sensors, uh, at, at this point, this is a little bit analogous to what we could call a cortical column. This could be a model of a cortical column. Uh, and independent moving sensors, you could imagine them processing it, uh, th them working like this with multiple of these, um, yeah, yeah, m m multiple of these in parallel. Uh, I don't really have much to say about this because you probably already understand it. It's just multiple of these in parallel. Well, it's interesting to point out there that uh, if you talk about multiple visual columns, they kind of move together, yeah. but here you're showing them separately, which is fine, which would be maybe like one column for your finger or one column for your eye or something like that. I mean, can I assume something like that? I mean, you have them moving independently, right. so. Yeah, so I like think, our fingers moving yeah, independently. Yeah, our fingers moving independently. It's like with yeah. vision, you got this weird thing that all the columns are sort of tied together. They move together. Yeah. Uh, but we're, the general case here is that they move independently, multiple fingers or something. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, but but this, I'm not going to stay here very long because now I'm going to move to this next stage of um, suppose uh, now, now rather than thinking of this as multiple moving sensors, um, think of it as an array of sensors that is sort of covering the whole image. Um, no movement is occurring anymore at least for this conversation, no movement's occurring anymore. Uh, and, and instead, when this column wants to, wants to get information about other parts of the image, rather than staccato over to it, it uses horizontal connectivity. So. Seems kind of magic. Uh, I said it seems kind of magic. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Did you want me to say that again? Or yeah, 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 no, that's correct. Oh, just, I'm saying that uh, I'm saying that a cortical column is processing. I'm gonna just keep you using the word cortical column. These, these are still story. three cortical columns. Right? Yeah, that's, that's that, yeah. And by the way, this is always our language. They never yeah, use the word yeah, cortical yeah. column in all of these papers. Um, the cortical column is processing input over time. It receives an input, and then from that, it sort of decides like uh, what to attend to next or where to get information from next. Uh, and it could do that using the large number of horizontal connections going in both directions. Uh, it can retrieve information from the, from the other parts of the sensory array, or at least the nearby ones. Is this uh, something they described in this paper? Or no. is this, this is your, you're making this up? I'm, make, I'm making this up, but then I'm gonna say the next thing is this, just unwound. Uh, so, okay, there's a lot of things that would be like, oh, how does that work? But you're not going to, we don't care about that now? Is that, that's why I say kind of magic. I well, it's just like, you, you can, 
this picture right here, uh, remember the paper that, I don't know if any of us even know who the authors were, but we all wrote this paper. <laughs> you presented it once. It was the one with like the inputs coming in and the and the activation cascading. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was when we were talking about disjoint pooling. Yeah. And uh, and there's a sort of flow of information in the different layers after yeah. an input comes in. Okay. Yeah. And what has happened? What is that flow of information? All that we have theories involving voting and things, but there's there, we might we might only know half of it. We might only know like the superficial layers. There's a lot of room for other things to be going on there. And you, it sounds like you're about to say something. You finish your sentence, yeah. Uh, and so uh, this idea of cortical columns in parallel uh, kind of computing, they're, they're taking their input and they're like, all right, uh, I need to know something about what's over there uh, in order to, to disambiguate what I'm looking at. Uh, and, and they get that through this sort of, through these horizontal connections. Uh, okay, that's that's going to say that yeah. in a slightly different way, so yeah. the same thing, let's see if I understand it. So there's, let's say there's three cortical columns, each one is processing one subset of the image there. All right, and they, so they get all of that information in parallel, that, and each of these cortical columns here are connected to each other laterally. And if a cortical column now says, oh, I want to get information from you know, image section number three, I can gate my inputs from the other cortical columns, so I'm only getting it from the third one. Yep. Um, and and now I'm going to do another cycle. This uh, is different there. than our voting method, right? No, it's, it's different. It's different. different. Yeah, there's no different. voting here, it's just the... No, these are, this is sort of an information transfer somehow between yeah. one column and the next. Um, so the difference between this and that is that you're not you're not directly getting sensory input from somewhere else. You're getting processed sensory input from these other uh, cortical columns. And, yes. and, and if I were to just like try to imagine where you're thinking this is going, am I thinking like, oh, that routing is going to involve the thalamus? Then? Is that the idea there? Is it the... so that that's going to be one of the possibilities? But yeah. the, but in this picture, it might actually be the horizontal connection. I, I have trouble imagining a mechanism that could possibly do that, but I'll leave, I'll let it pass for now. It might be the thalamus. Yeah. Well, uh, if it's if it's literally cortical columns like that, yeah, it would be hard probably. Yeah. I mean, it, it, just the kind of information you can pass between these columns, and how much is passed. We already know what some of it's doing. So, but if I can just accept the fact that this may actually be done via the thalamus, then I'm I'm good. <laughs> so, and we can go on then. <laughs> At least I can go on. So I can now transition to talking about the the actual model uh, in this paper known as transformer. Um, this, the, what I'm depicting here isn't the whole of Transformer, it's the new trick they introduced. Transformer is a term they use? Uh, yeah, tra yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that like a well-known term that's uh, yeah, very well known? At this point, it, Transformer it, became, it exploded on the scene. It has, uh, but, but it was introduced with this paper in 2017, okay. but it's everywhere now. Uh -huh. uh, and so, yes, the, this is, and, and I'll mention that, that, yes, this is not the whole of this model, this is the new neural trick that they introduce and they incorporate it into a MIP language model. Uh, so everything I just said before, um, you can imagine that a recurrent neural network, like all of these, all of these, you know, the, the, the little G's, the, the little arrows inside here, and these sideways arrows, um, you can take this and you can convert it into a feed forward network for a specific number of time steps. Uh, you, you, an alternate way of simulating this is like this, with multiple. So unraveling the circle. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and and I and that that is essentially. What but but, but the problem there because wait a second, this structurally is a problem yeah. because you're down here on the bottom picture there that the, the what's going on in that circle is that you're then changing the input to that column and changing the input to that column by moving. Your, well, not in this case, you're not moving. You're you're doing something. You're talking about this. But the point here is, that my guess I'm saying is, well, at least up in here, there was a cycle between what this gets from here and moving what this gets from here. And moving here, uh, this guy is not having any direct influence on this. It's I, it's like I can't. It's like uh, this is a series of steps in time, but yeah. it's always dealing with this. Now he's stretching this out, but these these moments in time, it's, you don't show these talking back down to here anymore. But, right? right, but this. Um even here, that was the case. Yeah. I don't have down arrows here either. Oh, 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 interesting. And you're assuming a static image here. 
Is that right? Yes. Yeah, no, okay. yeah. Uh, I haven't thought much about anything else. Uh, okay. All right. So you've already abandoned the whole movement idea completely. There's no interaction now. It's just a. Okay. Uh, abandoned in the sense I'm not talking about it right now. Well, I mean, up in the intermediate yeah. model one, there was this movement idea yeah. and so on, but now there's no movement ideas here. Yeah, right. I've converted it more into, movement has now been converted more into like routing. Okay, okay, yeah. Uh, just for purposes of understanding this, okay. it can always be re-added. Uh, and where was I? You're describing the other old network. thing I would want to say is so you just unroll all un yeah. this circle into time so yeah, now yeah. We three, now, three time steps yes now now just now to be clear um, I said we just unrolled this but I am using different learned weights of each of these stages it's not like I'm sharing the weights from here to here it is truly converting it into a feed work for network where all of these connections have different weights if I were literally unrolling this you'd, you'd use the same weights at every stage uh, and but otherwise, that is that is what this is. It's, it's this network that is, um, it is, every level of it is uh, receiving input, deciding where to attend to next, essentially. Like, it's, this one decides that, okay, I need to know what's here. This one decides I need to know what's here. It, I think it's useful to give a concrete example. Uh, and and I thought I wasn't going to mention language at all, but it actually, language actually provides some really nice toy examples uh, that, that are useful for thinking about this. So um, here I used a sentence from a blog post about this. Um, the animal didn't cross the street because it was too tired. A, a task here uh, that this network does really well is you can imagine feeding this, uh, this into one of these networks. The whole thing simultaneously. Yeah, that's what, that's what they do. That's, that's how it works. And that's, how, that's how these language models work. Well, they can't really feed well. the entire, like about a paragraph or Essay. I couldn't feed the entire essay at once, right? I mean, I think they usually feed a window at it. It's, right? it's, it's, it's a big window. It is a, it's a large window. But it's a, like, like this could all fit in one window. Yeah. So they could, I mean, our brains don't work like that, right? Sure. Uh, no, I, I know that I almost didn't bring up okay. language. All right, just, because I just, I'm not criticizing this. Almost point. think yeah, of this. It, my goal here is to come back to vision, essentially. Yeah. Uh, like, think of this almost like a vision problem. Yes, we don't have language parsing parts of our brain that, anyway. Um, the, I mean, literally, I, we really would move through this. Uh, I, I, through time, yeah. we would process this. We would, if I'm reading it, I'd read a piece of it and move my attentional, visual attention. If I'm hearing it, of course, it's not occurring all at once. Yeah. So, so they're basically, this is an example, again, of something that we absolutely have to do through time and with attention, uh, motor attention, if you will, or covert attention. But here they're saying, how do we can solve this in some sort of parallel process? Uh, yeah. So I knew it was risky for me to bring this up because that. But uh, but it, it, it does provide a useful example for yeah, thinking and through. Yeah, it's also what is people are using these models. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, I think and it solves fine. a really difficult problem here. Yeah, yeah it's all right. It's fine. I just want to make sure I understand what assumptions are being made and, and how it might relate to brains. You know. Yeah. Uh, so I it was already a lot of work to draw this many boxes. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you didn't want to you didn't want to pass this along in the Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> and they're nice boxes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so imagine this going up through multiple of these stages of processing. Um, once you get up to about like the fifth level uh, in these actual networks, the encoding of it, uh, which has allowed many of these optional paths inward, um, it, it successfully, once the model's been trained, uh, successfully the word it will refer to the correct uh, value. It'll refer to animal. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the attention has been routed cleverly in some way after five stages of processing to cut, make it where the, the, the representation for the word it is some combination of a couple things that mainly includes the animal. Mm -hmm. uh, and and, also and this is a really hard problem in NLP. Uh, to do these, uh, it so, would also refer to the street. Yeah, that's, yeah, the, like, yeah, that's, the, that's the reason this sentence is difficult, right? Uh, um, what is, so I'm, I'm still a little confused here because when we parse a sentence like this, um, there are multiple ways you can think about it. You know, it's not a static problem. And so you can say, oh, what does it refer to? Well, that's one problem. But what is it, it doing, and what, and what it, it is, and I don't know what it's hiring. These are all sentences. So, is there any sort of dy uh, temporal dynamics in this other than just? I mean, how did you decide that you decided that you want to figure out what it referred to versus something else in the sentence? Oh, oh, that's the thing. It's doing all of this in parallel. Uh, it's uh, this is a very parallel model where um, where every stage of this is 
as um, figuring out better and better ways to represent animal, better and better ways to represent didn't. Uh, every and part it does of the all sentence. simultaneously? Yes. Yeah. So what, what kind of representation do you have at the top? What does that mean? I mean, how do I interpret that? Um, uh, and there's almost an infinite number of ways I could parse this, think of things I want to talk about here. How does, how is all that represented at once? Yeah, I don't think I'd write the full network here, just, just not, part of it, right? Uh, yeah, I'm is really getting at the, the core neural trick. If I were tell, if I were telling the full story, what they're doing here is they're, they're, um, they're doing translation. Uh, so what they're going to do here is they're going to take this English sentence, move it into some intermediate thing that's not really in any language, and that's called the encoder. Mm -hmm. uh, then they have a decoder that puts it in, back into another language, like French or something like that. Uh, so a lot of the answer is going to be whatever the network chooses to learn. Uh, it's sort of learning some intermediate language. Uh, so is that, is that, is that the, the, when they designed this, was that the sort of end goal to take a one, uh, in one language and translate something to another language? Was that, was that, was that the, the task they assigned themselves? That was the task for the transport. So that, that doesn't necessarily imply... But I don't know if that's the end goal, though. I think they, right. that would be a task, but the end goal might be to get these intermediate representations that... But how do they know that they're... Uh, how do they know it's working, I guess the question is. Are they looking at translations? Is that the... They've done it on tons of different benchmarks, including translation. What would, yeah. what would be another benchmark? Uh, I guess I'm trying to get at here. Uh, one of the, the key things that you get with reference frames is you get a basis for knowledge. Uh, you have a basis for representing the knowledge in the world. And the question is, is there knowledge here, or is this a very, very clever um, translation technique? Um, um, you know, and if it's a clever translation, what what are the what are the clever things does it do, or is there, or is there some deeper knowledge about it? Uh, McCartney, you may have more exposure to some of the NLP benchmarks or stuff that these kind of. I think are. I think the main applications language model of predicting the next word in a sentence. Predicting the next word in a sentence, or maybe the next yeah. sentence. Yeah, that's what they have like in Jupyter two, that that famous language model. So you you put you put some word, and then it's just gonna complete, and you have like a whole text, a whole paragraph. Yeah, that's how they can Obviously, it. you can't always predict the next word in the sentence, and, uh, but you can do it statistically better than, yeah. than other ways. Um, I mean, clearly, the animal didn't cross the street. You can't predict street. You could have predicted street, but you could also, there's a lots of other answers that could have been there. So, uh, so I guess this makes some sort of a probabilistic metric or something. Yeah. Um, so so uh, just, uh, just kind of curious, once you get it into this intermediate language, um, is it in a form that they can then ask questions about it? Mm -hmm. I would assume so, but we're getting into the areas that I didn't try to prepare okay. very well. Because okay. basically what this network seems to do is kind of blend in, in a uniform series of steps both syntax and semantics. And I was just questioning whether it got to the level of semantic understanding that it understood what a noun was as a class, for instance, like an animal, you know, whether they, you know, well, it's kind of like if if you think of how maybe children learn language by whatever the pattern recognition process that they're doing. They don't, you know, explicitly study syntax. They don't explicitly study semantics, you know. But something like this going on could occur, and that, you know, there's some useful results that take that go from there. So I'm just, I, I you, you just basically said that you hadn't explored that, but I'm just kind of curious whether was that in any of the goals of, of, of what these transformer papers are trying to do. I think, I think so, but I really am not. It seems, it seems, you know, I've kind of come to this sort of hardened idea, and I shouldn't be hardened about it, but that the semantics of what an animal is, or what a street is, um, are, uh, or can't be learned this way. That you, I mean, I, I'm not saying you couldn't learn it through the language. You can learn some things through language, but not, there's a limit of things you can learn in language. For example, you could ask questions of this system, but I bet you couldn't ask what an animal is and what class, you know, what class, classifies as an animal, what kind of animals can cross streets, and what kind of animals can't cross streets, and how do, do they walk or run or swim or slither? I mean, you, I don't think you're going to get any of that out of this. Um, but so that the point of being able to do these sort of um, um, the, the whole trick of this, like, you know, give a sentence and it completes and makes a story, reminds me a lot of the earlier tricks of AI, which is really cool, but 
But is there really any understanding going in there? You know? I, I, I can I defend them a little bit. Yeah. I, I can defend them a little bit. Like okay. if, if what what they really are building, yes, it's like a hack to get it to auto generate sentences and mm-hmm. paragraphs. That's it's goofy. But what they want is the probabilistic model, so that uh, let's see, having a probabilistic model, just knowing like these these one hundred words are all are all. Uh, likely next words is a useful thing to have. And no, it's, it's not useful. Yeah. The question is, when you want to get to true, you know, AGI or whatever you want to get real true intelligence, I believe you have to have common sense knowledge about the world. And I don't think I don't see how you can get that. Right? I've already got in my mind that the only way you can get common sense knowledge is by arranging information in reference frames, and um, that's where the structure of the world comes from. Um, yeah. So I agree with you, obviously, but. Let me play devil's advocate give you there. This is extremely brute force, yeah. and there are huge amounts of uh, compute power and data yeah. that are being thrown at it. These are you know these billions of parameter yes. models, and so they would train it on billions of documents from the web. Yeah. So what will happen is many of the questions you're talking about, it could actually answer because someone on the web has already answered. Well, that's and true. And that's different sure. from, I would say that's totally different from true understanding. Yeah, yeah of course it is. But it's really hard to tell sometimes because almost anything you can think of to ask has already been well, done by someone no, else, I, so I, I can do it. I, 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 so you know, it'll, it'll, always, yeah. it'll always fall short. It'll always fall short, yeah. but it might be better than many humans. Uh, at, you know, certain so, at certain points, not all tests. Yeah. Uh, so um, that's kind of the, again, I don't agree with the brute force approach, but it, I mean, this gets the, the more core, more resources you throw, it gets harder and harder. The core idea that, that we pursue here at Momentum, and it's been my life's goal, is to say, you know, you can make, make machines that kind of look kind of smart, um, to, from very little smart to very look very large smart, but until you understand how the brain does it, you're not going to get it right. And so I don't think you can build a, a truly intelligent machine that essentially doesn't have a representation of knowledge, but it has this sort of probabilistic, you know, billions of you know, examples. Yeah. That, right? But I don't think that's their goal, sorry. Uh, no, I, I didn't say it was I, their I, goal. I don't know, but if you look at OpenAI, for example, that is... I mean, they well, don't they want to say get it's AGI. A, I don't know. Well, I, well, know. I think there are many, I would say the vast majority of AI researchers do not believe what I just said. Yeah, I don't think they're also trying to like replicate human style intelligence. No, they're 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 all stated. Cool. AGI is what they all want to do. I think that just like gets some money. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm very well, cynical. Well, it's interesting. You're making more close than I am. But that's not what I, my experience has been. My okay. experience is people say, no, this is the way we're going to get there. Well, then they should get like linguists and cognitive scientists on their teams. Maybe they do already. No, they don't. They don't. They feel. They feel they don't need linguists. They don't need cognitive scientists because you just throw in our data. No, and they don't think they as need as long as either, right? enough, so it's going to learn it. They don't. Well, think so. Why? What, linguists are just going to get in the way because they have their preconceived notions of stuff. And just throw enough data at it, and you know you have a. a they believe that neuroscientists are going to get in the way too. They, they, they believe that neuroscientists is just like I don't need to pay attention to that stuff. Because I could get these great you know, results without it. And you know, who needs to care what the brain work like that? I, well, anyway, that's been, it's been a 40 year observation on my part. Maybe it's changing now, but. Oh, you're probably right. I, yeah. yeah. I can't tell you how many times people say, like, well, there's no matter how the brain works. Yeah. Well, that's why I, like, I, I'm extremely suspicious when anyone tries to like, parallel anything in uh, neural networks with anything like, remotely related to the brain. I'm like, yeah, this is a very useful tool. You can optimize the all kinds of things, but like this isn't the same, even the same kind of tasks that the brain yeah. does. So the like question said, though is, can you get to the same end result, which is this AGI result? Do you, can you get there from this method, or do you do you have to incorporate knowledge about the brain? And so, given what we know about the brain today, I can say I think I know some things that have to be in there. So I'm asking, I'm, what I'm trying to understand is. Do they have anything like those things I think are necessary? And and that, you know, and I I'm trying to get to that point. Not like you might discover the right principles through this method. You might discover this. this you might replicate what a brain does during this method. But uh, my experience has been you, you probably won't. And, and now I know some things that have to be done. And I don't think they're being done here. Yeah, I, my my argument is uh, yeah. assume there is no such parallel unless it's explicitly stated. In which case, you should just be normally suspicious. Yeah. The question is, is you know, really, what you how. Are they, get, are they on the path to AGI using these techniques or not? And, um, and clearly they're very useful and valuable and they can do all this stuff with them, but it's, um, anyway, it's, it's a sort of meta question, I guess. Um. 
So when I when I saw this, I wasn't even trying to solve NLP. I, I was trying <laughs> to come up with how do I think NLP works, how, how the brain understands language. I was like, that's a cool neural trick. How can I use it in vision? Or how can I use it in the more sensory processing that we, do, we would expect all primates and, and rodents to be doing? Uh, and, um, and so this idea of, um, of processing the input and through multiple stages, either recurrent or multiple, like a feed-forward network, you add context to it. You, you take this it and you figure out more about what, what is going on around the it. Uh, uh, so I, 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 feel like oh, I just think I've got it a little bit yeah. here. You're training on lots and lots and lots of language here, right? So somehow through some, uh, some you know, very voluminous training methodology, it starts figuring out from many, many examples what the it might be related to. Is that the basic idea here? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Just by like seeing when it's wrong. Basically. Yeah, like seeing when it's wrong. I'll give you, I'll give you a 10 million sentences and there's an it. <laughs> Something you're trying to figure out what the it is. More for. like 100 billion. Okay, yeah. okay. So that's how it's learning this. I got it. Okay, I get it. Uh, so, but once it's learned, once it's learned, all it is is just a network with a bunch of weights, and those weights know how to uh, know how to solve the question. They they know how they have, they, have, they have learned an algorithm for saying like multiple stages of processing. You see the word it. Okay, look at look a few words sooner. Uh, what what is that word? Uh, through 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 a multiple multiple stages of like these fetches and looking around, it eventually adds this context to the word it. Uh, but Yes, it involves many examples to train those weights, but in the end, it's, you have a neural network that is that is that is t taking these inputs, adding context through multiple stages, and that seems like a really useful thing you can use elsewhere, uh, like vision processing. The idea that part of the image is going to cause you to need to retrieve extra context is going to cause you to have to figure out something else about another part of the image to interpret what you're seeing. Uh, and so I'll bring up something we're familiar with because we have a, we have our own explanations for it, is border ownership. Uh, that is a very similar problem where you see part of an image and uh, border and ownership, and half the room will know what it is. Uh, the, there are neurons in V1 that, um, that will only respond, like say this is the input to a neuron in, in V1, or this is, a, this is the input to the receptive field of a neuron in V1. Um, it will respond to this, but it will not respond to um, to the exact same to the exact same input if 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 the actual if the actual figure here is like like if, like if there's a white box you wouldn't here. respond to the same green box down here even though in the green box it's exactly the same wait wait you yeah, only it respond to it's on the left side up and up no 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 that's that none of they, none of them describe it that way they they, they all they all say that it's what where which side the figure or the ground is. That was the first paper. I think the other papers got went beyond that. It wasn't just which side. It was much more specific than side, if I recall. It's, it's only side. Yeah. Really? That I was, remember, that was I remember our the, first, the first paper was that, and then I thought we saw those other papers where they were more specific than that. It wasn't just anywhere on the side. It was, it was, it was actually specific points on the object. Um, um, and I think that's how we described it in our paper. I agree, but I've always uh, I've always come back and said that they, they've never actually distinguished this. They've never run this experiment, at least not published, to show whether this will respond here. I thought they did. Um, all right, we should check that again. Uh, so, we wait, what's the difference between what you said and what I said? Uh, uh, like, I said the, one side of the image and not the other. Or left the, side the, of the image in, in mine, it will also respond right here, and yours it won't. Oh, I see. Okay, because it's. I, 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 so it depends what you mean by the object. Yeah. So I'm surprised because um, this was a key point of those papers that it wasn't in the first paper, but it wasn't the second paper that I walked away from, and it really stuck in my mind because there's a very important difference um, between just which side and where you are on the object. And um, so I'd be surprised if I got that wrong, but if I did get it wrong, I want to know it um, because it's. Um, our models say that it should be more more specific than what you're suggesting. 
So you're saying that like by either lateral or top down or some other kind of connection that you basically get an indirect sort of pattern completion. Uh, it's, it's like the V comma V1 knows where it is on the object. Right. It's, it's not by interactions with other colors. Well, they, 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 they don't know how. how. No, no, they, right. no, no, they specifically rule out any feedback connections, for example. But there's, uh, they can't rule out horizontal connections. They, they try to make an argument for that based on the timing of the signals. Oh. Uh, it is so fast, this uh, uh, response appears so fast that, um, well, certainly feedback is ruled out, but uh -huh. even the lateral, I think they had an argument based on kind of how yeah. fast it's So, so our, our, so. our model says that the imp that column knows where it is on the object. It's not, it's not just getting some input. It, it knows the object, and it knows where it is on the object, and therefore it can represent that input differently. It, it doesn't require horizontal connections other than voting, and it doesn't require top-down connections. And that's how it can be so fast. The column itself predicts what it, the column knows what it's seeing. It's going to predict what it's going to see. But how could it do that if it doesn't have any context with the rest of the? Uh, if, but the, imagine if you if you're looking at something through a straw, mm -hmm. you're a single column, and you're looking at something through a straw, and you, you see just an edge, and then you start moving around, and you go, oh, that's an H, but you can still only see part of it. Right. right, but that takes longer than. No, I think they do allow. I'm trying to remember their model now. I think they do allow some lateral. It yeah. must. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they propose they proposed a mechanism which is very similar to our voting mechanism. Mm -hmm. They proposed another layer of cells that that basically allow the, the 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 things to communicate. So in our model, there's two ways a column can do that. One is like if it's a single column, we'd have to learn move around until it knows what the object is, then it mm -hmm. can do this. Or you can have a bunch of columns which vote together. As soon as they vote together, then you know where you are. Yeah. Um, so, but uh, it's an important distinction because I think if, if Marcus is right here that it's not as specific as I think it is, then um, then our argument's weaker. It, well, uh, and there are there um, experiments may not uh, be able to uh, tease yeah. that out. I, I, I remember the, um, yeah, maybe that's it because I remember looking at this very carefully and maybe did I talk to one of those guys? Oh, I talked to um, I don't I talked to Vanderheide at that uh, when I went to uh, uh, just John Hopkins, and um, um, so I, I don't remember I can't remember all the details, but I, this is the key component I was trying to get in on because this is a very important distinction. So if I'm wrong about it, I, I, I think in our models, if, if V1 is is able to know where it is on an object, it has to have been trained on small versions of that. Yes, object. it would have to. Yeah, I don't sure. know if they do that. Yeah, well, these are some of these are very highly trained. I think are, I don't know if they are. I have to go back and look. So there was a set of papers on this. I remember the first paper was very sort of as you said, Marcus, was just sort of like side left and right or something like that. I and mean, I thought subsequent papers were more detailed than that. But I, again. So these so are by Rudiger van der Heijn? Uh, yeah. Well, the first ones are by van der Heijn. It's all from his lab, yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, just to make sure it's clear, like, uh, this conversation is kind of orthogonal in that, uh, <laughs> that uh, I, uh, the application, how this could how this could potentially solve this uh, would work in both of these cases. Uh, okay. But uh, let, let's see. I will, oh, here, I will say one more note on that, though. Um, it's right there in the name, border ownership cells. Like, it's referring to which side is owned by the, the uh, let's see. Which border, side, the border doesn't say there's what, only left and right border. Which, border. Side, which side of the edge owns this border? Yeah, or which yeah, side yeah. of the edge is owned? The original the paper, I believe, you're right. And then the term border, you can't take the name border ownership from that. Because it could, it could also apply to what I'm saying. Wasn't there one where they showed it was like on the legs? It showed it was like the rear leg versus the forward leg of an animal or something like that. And it was like, uh, well, we just have to go back and look at it. We just go back. Let's not argue about it. We don't, we don't remember now. So, uh, yeah, this core neural me me mechanism, this core neural trick of taking input, grabbing some more context from the surroundings, grabbing some more context from the surroundings, uh, can, it's pretty obvious that you can imagine it solving this problem. Uh, and, and yes, it could do it in the speed forward way, but I, I do want to keep bringing back, like, um, especially, especially, I drew these little pluses here, um, these residual connections, which are also in resonance, the ones we use that have the many, many layers. Um, residual connections are very strange from a biological standpoint. Uh, the idea that you would take these and add the numbers, like add the numbers from here, from the previous layer to, to the next one. Why, why, I don't know where that adding is coming from. Is that just the mechanism they use or something? When, that's, that's how uh, all of these networks that have been successful recently do this. But this is, they do this in the language. Um, you're, you're saying it's a vision now, right? Um, 
Yeah, yeah. he's just saying that that's what they do in these transformer the, networks. But yeah. the transformer networks are all in the blind with networks, is that right? Or they or they no, the, the, they're more re okay, transformer. Yes, ones using this attention trick. No, because you know when I look at this, I'm asking myself, take the word attention out of it, and we'll so on. How is this different than a typical convolutional neural network that or a com you know that does uh, that does vision processing or vision? It seems to me this is very similar to what they the free forward networks look like today. I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, maybe what the you have to is. explain what those connections are. They they also have these um, multiplicative connections, right? Yeah. Um, so the so at each level of processing, what this is doing is it's it's figuring out um, uh, what do I want to attend to, uh, and it is basically doing an, essentially an initial scan of all of these to figure out what they vaguely are and which ones are relevant to it. Now, how is that any different than just like the standard classic backprop networks? You have a, a layer of neurons that's getting some fan in, some something below it, and it has to figure out what's important in that. Um, I think you're not explaining the, 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 connect, the, the yeah. actual connectivity. The, the With the, the queries and the keys yeah, and stuff. Yeah, yeah, I think you have to get to that level to explain, to, to explain it. Um, uh, yeah, okay. I'm just saying, if you show me this picture, I don't really see the other than maybe those little plus circle things. I don't really see. Well, the plus ones are also there. I don't see. Those I don't see how this is different than a classic uh, convolutional neural network doing yeah. kind of vision recognition. I mean, so, you can put different language on it. You might be saying, "Hey, there's an analogy," but it seems like what's different? It's like the same thing. I'm trying to decide if I can put it succinctly. Uh, the, is, it, is it different? Is it really? It, different? it is different. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. These, okay, I can't see it from this picture. Yeah, the, the, the thing that's going on here, ignore the skip level connections for that, ignore yeah. the pluses for that. The, the, the key here is what is happening at, happening at each of these interactions. Uh, and what is, what is happening is each of these is essentially coming up with a query where it's deciding which of these to pay attention to. Uh, and on the fly, it's like deciding that and then... But is, how is that different than... I have a whole bunch of fanning and in input to a neuron, and right. the neuron's deciding which synapses to pay attention to. <laughs> which ones should be strong, which ones should be weak. Uh, I have this input, and I'm saying, oh, this is the part that's I, uh, that's what, What's dynamic about it, other than the weights, I guess is what's, the way you're describing sounds like a more complicated mechanism than simply just weighting the inputs and saying who's. Yeah, that's a good way to But is it still differentiable, like this process? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, it has to be, so. Um, yeah, it's the same plus some bells and whistles. So, so <laughs> each of these is really important point. <laughs> each of these actually has two pieces inside of it. The first part is essentially the t the attention part, and the second is a conventional uh, is a conventional feed forward layer, FF layer. Uh, so the attention part is more of a dynamic thing. It's it's, uh, it's doing okay. something very th thalamus like. Okay. Maybe that's one way to say it. It's doing. It's it's choosing what parts to route into this. And how do they implement that? Uh, is it is it a special little mechanism they do, or is it just a bunch of neurons with synapses? No, there's a special mechanism. Oh, uh, okay. Like, well, that's important to know. That that's it, that's what I didn't see here. So there are different ways to think about it. Is there's a lot of um, flexibility in how you draw these boxes and what where what, what what you say is happening where. The way that might make sense to describe it as the output of this layer isn't just, okay, as multiple output populations. One of those populations is saying that, like, here's what I'm representing. Another one is saying, like, um, here's what you should query in the next level of processing. Query meaning here's what I should attend to. Yeah, here's, here's it's like almost instructions telling you, like, um, uh, all right. So there's a dynamic routing mechanism called that attention box. Is that what that is? Yes. So, so and uh, and is that hardwired in the sense that how the possible ways I can attend to my input and I'm just picking one of the hardwired mechanisms, or is it is that learned as well? Uh, what is learned is is uh, is the strategy, the instruction, the, the okay, what, so, what it tells the next layer. Here's what you should. Okay, so that's learned. So that would be like if I want to call up the thalamus, let's say. Yeah. Then I would sort of say I have this multiplexing router thing I got. It's kind of, maybe I'm going to call it hardwired, and uh, and now I'm going to learn which instructions to send to my multiplexer or my routing system. Yeah. Okay. 
So is it saying if you see this, look for this? Is it kind of doing? Yeah, that? yeah. But it's not but, saying but, what to look for. It's just well, saying where to look. Right. What, I, what I'm trying to say is is, is oh, that right. he's he's selecting from multiple inputs coming in there, right? So I'm trying to figure out is that something that's just pushed forward to what you ask for in the next network, or is he deciding? on that attention thing, which are these things to pay, uh, pay attention to, which would be, in my mind, a little more powerful rather than just pushing the question up. So I'm trying to figure out what exactly that attention mechanism is doing. It's doing something along the lines of, if you see this, look for this. But I mean, telling the next layer to look for that. Yeah. But the thing is, it's kind of arbitrary where we draw these lines. If I say I'm telling the next layer, um, you could have instead, I could have told you a different story. I'm like, this layer looks at it and decides what to look at next, and then it looks at it. It's arbitrary. I could have, this, this block could have just as easily been drawn at the top of this, of here. Like, you, it's kind of arbitrary where you draw these lines and how you interpret it. Uh, okay. So I, we'll go ahead and finish. No, no, I'm finished. So I, you know, there's this, this is sort of unknown, weird dichotomy we still deal with. We don't really understand yet in cortex. Uh, we now believe that the cortex, every cortical column, is a complete processing unit. It's dynamic. It's doing sensory mode inference and so on. Yet we also know that they are somewhat structured in a hierarchy, partially structured in a hierarchy. And so there's clearly there is, you know, the input to V2 is not only just coming from the retina; it's also coming from V1. So we have this like, oh, what's what's going on here? And so one way, to, uh, so I guess, uh, you know, that, that, that is a bugaboo that it just continues to bother me and, and we don't really understand that. When I look at this picture, I can look at a couple ways. I could say like, oh, this is really, you're just unfolding in time, what you showed in model yeah. number two, and therefore this could be a dynamic process occurring in a single column, yeah. it's attending to different things and has this routing mechanism, and that's fits exactly what we think, right? Yeah. On the other hand, you could say, yes, maybe that exists, but here you're showing unfolding at times, so maybe it's both. Um, but, but I'm not sure these diagrams consider both. Um, it's like I, I think I'm intentionally leaving both of those out there for you. They're yeah. my, both might be happening. Well, it looks like both are happening, right? So any particular region, again, there's this, if V2 gets input from the retina, and V2 gets input from V1. And, um, and so when V2 gets in from the REPA, it is going through the thalamus, through the pulvinar, and it's routing, uh, not, well, we actually don't know if it's pulvinar, it might be, it gets it actually, I think, directly from LGM. Um, but, so it's getting some direct input from the retina, and it's able to attend, but it's also getting input from V1 through the, through the pulvinar, through the thalamus, and it's able to attend that too. So there's like, it's like this guy, this guy is somehow getting, it's say, takes an input here and attending to some section here, but it's also get attending to something down here at the same time. And we don't understand that. Mm -hmm. um, but the way you've described it, it's just unfolding in time, that would only be one of those mechanisms. Um, um, so it seems to be a combination of the two. Mm -hmm. uh, is that would be consistent with what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and one, one thing I'd like to point out, I, I started to say this before, but then we started, we got a little distracted by these pluses and the feed forward thing. But I'm gonna bring back the pluses now. I'm just making myself more room. Uh, so, in general, like here I'm going to say something that is more general. It doesn't only apply to attention transformer and stuff. Um, so these, these many layer networks, the ResNets, the ones with residual connections, the ones where everything goes like this, every, everything goes up and adds. Um, can you, can, I'm sorry, what does the word residual connection mean? Uh, you can call them, okay. One interpretation is skip level connections. Uh, no, no, it specifically means adding them because dense nets. I mean, is, everybody, everybody, is everyone in deep learning know what residual connections means? Yes. Okay, yeah. I don't know what that means. Uh, so it. It's just so literally you, you take the other thing and add it. it you, you skip your skip level connection adds to the output of the previous. Okay. Yeah. And why is that called residual? I can explain it if you want, but it's a. Little, it's, it's like a. So I try try understand the word or just forget it. Just that's the name for that. The idea is that it's it's easier to model the difference between the output and your input than to model the complex function that's actually doing it. And so, um, yeah. so they're modeling the differences rather than the actual. That's similar to that's the coding or something like that, is it? And for the coding model, the differences. Yeah, it's just a feed forward system. Okay. 
It's, it's one, one. Is there is there an interpretation of why it's called residual? Is there a meaning for that? Yeah, because it's taking a subtraction. It's the, it's a, it's oh, the residual it's as, the the residual is that's what's left over after a subtraction, yeah, yeah. as opposed to what's just left over. In general. Yeah, it's modeling the error rather than the actual function. Got it. Yeah, that's the idea. Okay. Uh, so these networks, um, it, I thought they were bizarre first time I saw them uh, because the idea of, it, of taking this and adding it, essentially, like if you think of this as a layer of cells with a bunch of output axons, it's almost like these are adding to those axons. Uh, it's, this, it's, it's bizarre, it doesn't work with biology. Um, or another take though, is that like what, what is usually the case with these is all of these have the exact same number of cells. This might be 1,000 cells. This is also 1,000 cells. This is also 1,000. It would suddenly seem much more sane if you say, oh, every time I see one of those, it's actually a, rec a recurrent network being unrolled. Every time I see one of these, like if, if I interpret this as this is actually, you know, this I'll, I'll draw a G, uh, it's, it's actually one of those um, being unrolled, and it's just the case that um, the difference is difference is these are different weights than these than these. Um, my angle here is that uh, that artificial neurons are oversimplified. Actual biological neurons have more capability of doing this with. Um, have more capability of having multiple connections. Like unit A, cell A, might connect to cell B in multiple ways, on this dendrite in one way, and this yeah. dendrite in another way. So this might actually be an artifact of the simple neurons we're using. And the ResNets we're training are an essential, like to the extent that they're using principles of biology, they might actually be mimicking this and not, uh, not networks. And this is what this really plays into here. This network is using these residual connections, uh, and it may suddenly, um, yeah. So we may be actually simulating this network, or we being the, the AI community who's, who's running these. In a sense, where where the, what we're doing this way, the brain would do this way to the extent yeah. that these overlap. Yeah. Yeah. I think well, I think the, the the big big key difference here is is part of the complexity in that box, the, the circular G box, is um, is is you know the sort of um, good cell play cell sort of analogy thing going on. Yes. And so you're not just getting this input; you're getting this input in the context of some framework, a reference frame, and therefore uh, you. It just endows so much more power to that thing. It's you know you, you can literally build a model of the entire object in that one box over time. And so to me, you know, if we were to do a if we were to do the biological model of attention, it's something that we've talked about here, and you've talked about it too, Marcus. We've all done this, where is when we're attending to different things in the world, like you're just literally attending to different parts of your visual scene or different parts of your, with your fingers. Um, you are building up this uh, structured environment of reference frames of reference frames, and and so we're not we're not just it's not this is two D representation of the world or this one D representation of time. Um, it's really we're building up this sort of structure like this is relative to this and this location, this space, and this and um, and I, sometime I, I really want to go through that carefully because we started talking about this and you've had some interesting ideas about it. Um, about how what is required to build that model through attention, like this, you know, the pose of an object relative to your body, the pose of an object relative to the structure to the parent object. That process to me seems like a very, very fruitful way of thinking about attention. We have to solve that. And if we did that, then we could then we then we have a, then we could trend, we could compare it more accurately to this. So I think it's really two completely different worlds of attention. When you start introducing reference frames to these these things, then what you think about as attention becomes much more rich. Um, that's all market. Um, I think you have to get there. I don't think you can really do any of this stuff without that. Without that. Can I ask about uh, something uh, that you said? So, um, when you talked about uh, in neurobiology, neurophysiology, that uh, you can get an activation through multiple paths. Uh, so I'm just trying to think if the analogy of the recursion here is to get different weights on there. I mean, the synap synapses are not going to change dynamically that fast, but if you're saying that we can get the recirculation by e-activate, you know, 
uh, a different set of, uh, of cell bodies that then sent out a different set of, of uh, get picked off of uh, a different dendritic tree to feed into the same thing. Is that what your analogy is to the different weights and the different recursion layers? Is that you know you're you're you're, you're basically cycling around through different parts of the network within that same complex? Right. When, when, when I did this. The, this transition, I said that I'm waving my hands in the air and saying dendrites, multiple axons, like there's uh, there's probably room for this to occur. And not saying anything specific, uh, but yes, it would be, if I understand your question right, mm -hmm. it would be uh, through the fact that these, that there are, that neurons can have multiple connections to each other via different dendrites or different parts. Parts of mm -hmm. so one way to think about maybe one way to think about that, and correct me if, I, if I'm misinterpreting. When we think about activations, it's always a population, a sparse population, and activating another sparse population. And an individual cell can participate in multiple, many different uh, of those associations between sparse population and sparse population. So, and they're very orthogonal. So if you if you look at the a population code, the individual neuron may not mean much at all, um, but the population code is everything. So. Uh, and you only get this property if you have uh, multiple dendritic branches where you, the individual cell can be part of hundreds of different populations and they don't conflict. Is that sort of what we're... we're that's one, that's you know? one angle on this. Yeah. I also think it's interesting, and you might have been hinting at something, Kevin, which I just wanted to just plant a seed in your mind, maybe if I, I might have misinterpreted what you said, is that um, uh, it, it, we think of no, synapses can't change very rapidly. Um, but that's not really true. It, it's, it's true in, in the classic view, but, but there's an exception, an important exception to this. First, we know that the brain learns things very rapidly. You could look at something on this board right now, and you could have only looked at this board for a minute or two, and you would have walked away, and you would remember things about this board mm -hmm. right away. Mm -hmm. And those are not recurrent activity in your brain. That's not like cycling neurons going on. Mm -hmm. And so uh, uh, this very fast term memory, the only mechanism we think can do that, and we think it's actually, the more I learn about it, the more I think it's going everywhere in the cortex, to different extents is that you have the, you can take what are called silent synapses and turn them into active synapses, and it happens instantaneously, very rapidly. Um, and so when you learn something very, very quickly, though any moment to moment, even just, you know, just remembering that sentence, you know, I could probably recreate that sentence, how do I remember that? Well, I'll forget it later. Um, um, but I remember it has to do with an animal crossing the street, and, you know, and it was too tired to think, how do I remember that, right? It's not like I have some recurring thing going on in my head. It's because, and I didn't have time to form new synapses. There was not enough time to grow new synapses. It's taking maybe 45 minutes to an hour to do that at minimum. Mm -hmm. um, so what's going on, we think is going on, there's lots of these silent synapses that are just sitting there really kind of zero weight, they don't do anything. And you can metabolically turn them on very rapidly. And that's, that's and that seems to be, that was known to exist in the hippocampus. Now it seems to be existing everywhere in the cortex. So when we think about rapid memory, that's what I think about. And um, that's also the time scale in which you get potentiation or depression of uh, existing active synapses. So yeah. You distribute distributed across synapses. Yeah, but the problem with, the problem with that, well, the problem with uh, the idea of, uh, you know, depression and, and is that, those are minor changes, right? And what we require in our, the whole thing, all of our models require that you're able to learn these major new associations right, very rapidly. And it's hard to do that by tweaking individual synapses that already had some weight. It's much, it's like, if I wanna, if I wanna learn, here's a population code, and here's a population code, um, and let's say the two separate sets of neurons, but they could be the same set of neurons over time, but let's say the two separate sets of neurons. And I wanna say this pattern here and this pattern here, I wanna associate rapidly. Um, it's, it's, it's unlikely that I have all the, if I had already trained a bunch of synapses to see them, I want to, it's hard for me to just to tweak those values. It's much more powerful just to say, let's turn on some new synapses here. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so it is that time, I'm not just agreeing with you, Aris, but I think, I think this idea of the silent synapses, um, uh, it, it's the only thing that makes sense in my mind. Um, and we knew about this in the hippocampus, and then I was starting to, starting to talk to some neuroscientists about it in the cortex, and people said, oh yeah, we're finding them everywhere in the cortex. Um, so I think that's going to be the, I think, I'm guessing, that that's going to be the main way this happens. When you say metabolic and turned on, what's the actual mechanism? Uh, there's, I don't remember it, Kevin. There's a lot of, um, uh, you just imagine you've got 
I, I, don't, I don't remember the details, but you've got a synapse. Right. But when it, when it actually potentially arrives and there's neurotransmitter released, it doesn't have the appropriate effect on the other side. Okay. And so the standard heavy type of learning, what you want to do is you don't want to just a temporary um, influence. You want to have it essentially change the, 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 the structure of the, the postsynaptic synapse right. so now that it does respond to that. So these, these, there are synapses that just don't seem to have any effect. They're there physically, the neurotransmitter gets released, but on the postsynaptic side, nothing I happens. See. And so I don't remember the details. It is documented. Um, people do know that. I don't remember them. Okay. Well, it's you can look up science synapses. Yeah. Um, I, I, the, I've got it in my notes. <laughs> What's that? I've got it in my notes. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm I'm done with my part of this. Just like to brief summarize, I, I was I wanted to bring in like historical where attention came into this, why this is called attention. Because when you first read about this, it feels kind of strange to call it attention. Uh, and so here's kind of a logical progression of how it all how it all happened. Yeah. And uh, well, I think the most interesting thing you've said here is you said they've introduced a sort of a multiplexer attentional type of mechanism. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think yeah. I, I'm I'm interested in that. I remember reading about this last year, but it's it is very reminiscent of the thalamic and well. So the question is, I want I'd be interested in knowing more detail think, about that. Yeah, I think it'd be good to go into detail on, on exactly. Can that. we learn something from that about what what the thalamus might? Maybe it'll give us some clues about you know because we've studied that a lot, of course, in the thalamus what mechanisms could exist there, but maybe they figured out something um, that could be useful for us. Um, it's interesting. This is, a, I think, it's a great. This is an example where one more thing that we know is going, we think is going on in the brain, is now neural networks. People are trying to figure out, hey, maybe I need something like that, and they came out in a different direction. So I think it's great. Um, I think that's a, a positive thing um, that this new mechanism that is required. Um, one question I have. So one one thing that's noteworthy in this network is that, in a sense, uh, in in a sense every quote-unquote cortical column is doing attention independently of all the other ones. Yeah, I think, I'm, uh, well, it's interesting. Is it well, if you use the word attention, I think it gets confusing. If you use routing or gating, then yep. it might be a little bit... Uh, is it, would they all be independent? It's, okay, uh, they, they're, in, they're impacting each other, but they have the ability, if they, if the network wants to learn to have all these be totally independent, it will. Uh, and so there's no, there's nothing straining attention to be some single spotlight. Well, well, I, I, well I think <laughs> I would might put it another way. Okay. Attention is thought of as a global thing. That's that's maybe you can have a spotlight or a word attention or whatever. But they're using the word attention, but it's not really attention. It's like more distributed routing and gating and you know maybe even voting and things like that, which can happen independently all over the place. So I think they're. I think the word attention necessarily implies a global. Yeah, uh, and I think if we talk about a thalamus, thalamic version, it's almost guaranteed to be sort of a centralized thing because you're taking this large cortical area, and if you're relying on the thalamic relay cells and the thalamic particular nucleus to do this, then you've got this very small centralized thing, and that's the whole point of bringing them all down to one point. Remember, we were talking about it for scaling and for you know routing. It's because it becomes one point, it enables a central attention, and it kind of throws away the possibility of independent attention. Mm -hmm. So I think your point is you could have individual routing in a, in a column, yeah. but if you talk about the thalamus part, then it's a then it's a spotlight type of thing. Um, so it's kind of maybe it's both. Um, but is this system required that they're all independent, if, uh, as you said, or is it just? Yeah, I mean, that's how it works. Like, go back to the crazy parallel example. What they're really doing is they're in parallel processing every word of the sentence. Or yeah. every word of, and, and each of these is choosing in each stage of processing what it wants to attend to. Um, each column, in some yeah, sense. Yeah. And it would, it would, you'd see something similar, putting a sheet of columns over a 2D image. Every every time step or every level of the feed forward network would be choosing how to attend. At each I think that's true. If um, I mean, imagine I had uh, two columns: one's a visual column and one's a somatosensory column, right? Yeah. Well, they're going to have separate attentions, right? They're moving independently, physically moving independently. Um, so they're sensing different parts of the object, 
um, that they have to attend differently, right? It's now you get to this interesting question of, and, and it's interesting too. If I took the two, two somatosensory columns representing two different fingertips, well, they're going to be independent too, I think. But when you get the vision, it's not, it doesn't look like it. Um, and so you know, because they're all moving together, um, so that uh, there might be some, you know, at this point, this is maybe some observation. And there is the chance that using the soup test sort of already said this. Using the word attention is confusing the conversation. Yeah. If you describe this as like routing and how you do kind of want routing, if you do want parts of this image like seeing this part, forget the border ownership. Just yeah. use the example. Parts of the image you will cause you to want to 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 to, to properly sense what's here, you need to know it's over here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But meanwhile, this column over here, for it to properly sense what it's sensing, it needs to know something else. And if you think of that as a routing question, there's no problem. It's just once you call it, use the word attention, maybe that's confusing the conversation. Mm. So th this yeah. is a whole set of possibilities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, again, my way is interesting that they have an attention mechanism, which is a routing mechanism. Yeah, we might want to have a meeting just or a short session. Yeah, just like, what's, the, what's the basis of that? You know, how's it work? Is it relying on sparsity? Does it, is it, if I have, if I have a dense set of activations coming in, how do I tend to some, I mean, what, what mechanism is that? You know? Yeah, they have roughly sort of the input coming in and queries and uh, they kind of multiply uh, to, to figure out which ones, mm. you know, actually, uh, no, it's, it's, like, it's like, like a convolution then. Huh? It's, it's basically just a convolution. It's actually yeah. a gating. No, it's like a multiplicative. Yeah. Uh, you know, the convolution in the signal processing sense where you just like you pass, it's like a pass filter or something. But that's soon summing uh, outputs. He's, this sounds like more of a gating mechanism. Okay. Yeah. Like, more like an and. <laughs> it's more like the queries are modulating different parts of the input, mm -hmm. and you learn what the modulated weight is. Mm -hmm. Isn't that like involving the? The, the, the convolving, uh, uh, then you're assuming you're summing. Isn't that, but that's a different type of convolving than a convolution layer, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. It is <laughs> which is a whole different thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you say it's a convolution involved. You go fill me, go think that's not a convolution layer. But it's convolving in the, in the mathematical sense, I guess. Yeah, that, that, that was what I thought apparently, um, not quite like that. Maybe. Um, yeah, that's interesting. I think it'd be, it'd be that should, in theory, should be a pretty straightforward explanation. Maybe you already gave it. Maybe that's it. You just take a you take a query, which is some some dense representation, and you have a and you multiply it times the input, and then tell you what you're going to get. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Um, uh, can I try to explain? I mean, might be hard on the audio, but <laughs> uh, I think Jeff, Jeff is uh, all right. So each one of those blocks, like in the language example, they have uh, a key, a query, and a value. So what you do is, uh, for one of those boxes, like box one, you get uh, the query, and then you multiply by the key of all the other boxes. The key? Yeah, you, you get, uh, you have like a query value for like, let's say, key one or D, and then you multiply by all the other uh, keys or all the other words, like animal didn't cross the street. Oh, I see. And then you, you take a softmax over that, then you have like a probability distribution that tells you how much you're gonna pay attention to each of those words. And then you multiply that probability by the value, and then you sum all those values. So the new representation for the word uh, like takes into account a, a bit of the value of all the other words that's dependent of that probability. I don't know if, it's hard to explain on the other. <laughs> like I'm pointing to the word, but you can't see it. <laughs> Does it make any sense? Uh, yeah, a little bit. I think I, I, think I got what you were saying. Uh, okay, interesting. Still, still would warrant a, a discussion. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I didn't know anything about so, that at all. I, I was, I really wanted to work on this this weekend, but I could, didn't have time. I was moving to my daughter. She was moving her apartment this weekend. Um, but I wanted to see if I could walk through some of the, the, the previous conversations we had about attention in our model and what's required to build a model of the, you know, a, a temporary model of the world by attending the different components and what, what are the different reference frames required. I think that would be a, a really nice supplement to a different sort of view of attention with reference frames um, that, that we could talk about. Um, so, but I didn't do that yet. Okay.
That was good. It's a good time to stop. Yeah, thanks. Cool. That was good. Not sure if that was the journal club that I promised, but no, it was. <laughs> exactly. Perfect. Exactly. 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 Marcus, can yeah. I ask what is on the what is on the right problem solution? That's another. That's oh, from a previous. Yeah, sorry. That, ah, that was my hand. No, that was Jeff. That was from ah, earlier. Okay. Earlier. Uh, All right. Okay. In fact, it's, it's, there's a thalamus. Even talking about the thalamus. Yeah. How to interpret the thalamus to different versions? Yeah. I want to get back to that. All right, thanks. All right, that was great.